assalamu alaikum everyone and welcome to the class of 20th century english poetry the course is designed for bs english semester 8 and m english semester 4 and the course code is engl4139 and i am sumaya abid today the topic of our discussion would be the use of animal imagery in ted hughes poetry Ted Hughes as you know was a poet laureate he is most commonly and most famously known as an an animal poet he is also called a poet of blood and guts and because of his use of animal imagery he is called a terror's ambassador he is also called a heathcliff and he is known as an incredible hulk of british literature so um, our focus is on his use of animal imagery and uh, the most important thing that we need to say is that it is only because of animal imagery that ted hughes has such a big name uh, but before we move to uh, ted hughes use of animal imagery let's see how the use of animal imagery is um, how animal imagery has been used over the centuries in literature um, many writers over the centuries have been fond of um, uh, this um, fond of animal and uh, the use of animal imagery and we have the very old and classical name as aesop aesop's fables as uh, uh, you know they were uh, they represent animals and uh, the story of human beings through um, animals and then a um, uh, very imp- uh, big name william shakespeare he also depicted animal uh, not exactly that he was uh, very much focused on animal rather he made a use of animal imagery in order to uh, in order to give an insight into the human behavior and human psychology and we find an abundant use of animal imagery in shakespeare's um, uh, othello as well as king lear um, uh, and uh, uh, king lear is a play in which uh, 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 there are around the uh, there are uh, there is a mention of around 55 animals in 135 different references so it shows a writer's preoccupation with Uh, this particular use of animal imagery dh lawrence uh, again a big name he was a he was he was a novelist but he also wrote uh, poems of uh, of some worth and most prominent uh, poem or most uh, um, typically uh, typically uh, lawrence poem is uh, his poem snake uh, george orwell is very famous novel animal farm represents uh human behavior in, in humor a modern uh, the the dilemma of a modern man uh in the form of a novel and through uh, animals and it's an allegory wilfred owen he was a war poet and um, uh, through his use of animal Im- imagery he shows the violence um, that resulted in the form of world war 1 and he exposes the violence the uh, the ferocious and the uh, uh bestial side of human beings through the use of animal imagery in his anti war poetry and then we move to ted hughes who um is who gained the title of the poet of animals because the most uh prominent character in his poetry is or are animals okay what is the function of animal imagery why the writers tend to use this imagery we see uh, that the reason can be for the love or hate for animal though uh, most of the time it is the love or the the keen observation about the animals but uh, but it also uh, to some extent can refer to the uh, the use of uh, uh, animals to show some sort of dislike uh, it can also refer to uh, art for art sake it's it's it can it can be simply the depiction of animal just for the uh, for the sake of depicting it and um, animal imagery is used for symbolic meaning and uh, most importantly it is used to explore the world of nature and uh, 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 one important Uh, thing that a modern poets or modern writers tend to uh, tend to use animals for is the use of wildlife or depiction of wildlife 
to show some parallels with human beings. Uh, another function that animal uh, serve in any writing is to dehumanize the characters. Uh, uh, usually, uh, something that we find in um, in the plays like King Lear and. Uh, Othello. Um, and, um, animal imagery is also something that creates new myth. Myth is not something that is um, um, uh, has uh, that is like a given story that you find in classical mythology like Greek and Roman mythology. Rather, uh, creating myth means to create a new discourse, creating a, a new meaning to the life. And to attempt an understanding from a, dis a different perspective and be one with animal. Be one with animal means that when you are looking at the world from your from the perspective of an animal. So as far as uh, the, uh, an uh, the animal imagery in Ted Hughes poetry is concerned, we see that animal or a poem are one and the same thing for Ted Hughes. And uh, this is his own quotation from his book, Poetry in the Making. And this is a very important uh, book uh, as far as uh, the understanding of po uh, Hughes poetry is concerned, uh, in which he explains many things that uh, uh, being writer only he can do. Okay, um, so uh, he says, I think of a poem as a sort of animal. They have their own life, like animals, by which I mean that they seem quite separate from any person, even from their author. So he, he here is saying that animals, they have their own existence, their own identity, and they are separate from the author, author who is the creator of those animals in the form of poetry. And nothing can be added to them or taken away without maiming and perhaps even killing them. Them. Maming is to injure. So whenever a particular piece or um, some words are omitted from a poem, it uh, the, a good poem will be killed because a poem is a complete whole. It has its own existence like a human being. And they have a certain wisdom. He's talking about the poetry and they have a certain wisdom. And he is talking about the animal as well. Maybe my concern has been to capture not animals, particularly and not points but simply things which have a vivid life of their own outside mind and this is a very important um, uh, idea as far as uh, Ted Hughes poetry is concerned because uh, he is uh, 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 he is uh, saying that a poem is like an animal and like an animal is uh, has its own vitality its energy its force uh, and its own life and existence similarly a poem has its own existence it's a very much a breathing um, uh, breathing life that a poem has uh, similarly, he says in the same book, The Poetry in the Making, with me, the two interests have been one interest. Uh, the interest of uh, capturing animal and of writing poetry has been one interest. My pursuit of mice at threshing time when I was a boy and my present pursuit of poems seem to be different stages of the same fever. So he is, uh, in his book, Poetry in the Making, is making this point clear that uh, his, uh, if you trace back the origin uh, from where uh, this uh, pursuit of writing poetry came into his uh, being, he uh, he goes back to the to those old days when he was a child and he used to pursue uh, mice or any other animal uh, in his childhood. So uh, we come to the point that why animal? Uh, exactly uh, why not something else why animals so we reach the point that in Ted use we move from capturing animals to capturing animals this is a in, this is a very interesting concept look at uh, be focused on what I'm saying and uh, try to analyze um, what is written uh, right in front of you on the slides from capturing an animals to capturing animals okay the very first one uh, the one written on the left means from capturing animal means in real life hunting so capturing here refers to actual hunting of animals or actually uh, capturing animals whereas the capturing of uh, to capturing an, uh, of animals mean uh, writing poetry so from capturing animals in real life or uh, in the form of hunting uh, Ted Hughes moved to capturing animals through his writing through his poetry 
okay and uh, if we look at the biography of Fred Hughes we find a causal relationship between his biography his life and his writing uh, his uh, writing poetry causal is the cause and effect relationship so there is this cause and effect relationship uh, in uh, Hughes poetry he says and these are all the lines from his book poetry in the making if you really want to understand uh, uh, po Fred Hughes poetry uh, this is the book for you that I have also given a reference of in uh, the work cited list by the end of my lecture my interest in animals began when I began so uh, he the interest in animals is there right from the beginning of his origin or, or the or the or, or from the time when he was uh, he became conscious of his own self at the age of three that is very young age his house was loaded with toy animals so much so that his zoo became infinite uh, zoo that will be the personal collection of animals in the form of toys at the age of four he was gifted with a thick green backed animal book by his aunt so uh, again he got a very good um, he got a hold of a very good book that was given to him by his aunt at the age of four again reinforcing his interest in animals and then he started drawing uh, animals and interestingly in the same book uh, poetry in the making he says that my drawing in my draw the animals were very good in the books but they were uh, they seem even more good in uh, his drawing so appreciating himself or uh, showing his keen interest in animals so again talking about the animals he says it was not an indoor affair indoor like you are sitting in a house being a child playing with toys and looking at the books and drawing rather it became uh, an outdoor affair when they moved to um, the south York yorkshire but before that they used to live in uh, west yorkshire and uh, with uh, where he used to go with his brother older brother with a rifle he, his brother used to hunt and he used to follow him and uh, collect all the dead animals or birds and at the age of eight they moved to south yorkshire and it proved something good for him for uh, and because uh, this move gave him a lifetime experience and uh, because at that place there was a farm in nearby country and it was a private estate uh, state with birds and lakes and this was um, and this uh, actually became a source of inspiration and uh, um, a storehouse of memories for Ted Hughes finally at the age of 14 a change overtook him and uh, even 14 is a is quite a young age but that age what was that age that uh, actually uh, made contribution in reduced writing poetry he says I accused myself of disturbing their lives I began to look at them you see from their own point of view and this is the change and this is perhaps the first step towards maturity that um, uh, from the pursuit of that of those animals um, like actually capturing them he moved towards understanding of those animals and he started writing poems and it is at the age of 14 he himself says in his book poetry in the making and origins and growth of in his poetry in writing began at that very age okay uh, if we talk about um, Ted Hughes uh, poetry um, and if we say that a poem for him is like an animal uh, we uh, question that what is a similarity then between a poem and an animal uh, he himself raises this question he says how can a poem for instance about a walk in the rain be like an animal and uh, uh, to give answer to this very question he himself states it is better to call it an assembly of living parts moved by a single spirit and is talking about poetry that it is an assembly assembly when you collect when you put things together living parts not objects not dead things it is the assembly of living parts moving by a single spirit the living parts are the words the images the rhythms the spirit is the life which inhabits them when they all work together so words images and rhythms when together they work they make up uh, a, uh, a poem um, a poem like uh, live like uh, uh, like a living being it is impossible to say which comes first parts or spirits parts being words images and rhythms he says that it is such a subtle process that he is unable to see w uh, or understand which comes first uh, the parts or the spirit but if any of the parts are dead if any of the parts like words images and rhythms are dead if any of the words or images or rhythms do not jump to life as you read them then the creature is going to be named and the spirit sickly 
uh, uh, creature the poem is going to be maimed injured maimed is injured and the spirit the life of that poem is going to be sickly so uh, in order to give so since you are students in order to give you a better understanding i'll give you an example uh, uh, of uh, uh, of a dissection of frog that is given by eb whites in his essay some remarks uh, on humor he says that um, uh, if we compare any piece of literature or a poem particularly with a frog or the dissection of frog what happens in a, in dissection that when you you cut uh, a frog open like you do um, experiments in your matriculation uh, being science students or in your in your eyes uh, or your FSC so what happens that you are able to identify what is heart where is where are the lungs and so on but what happens by the end it happens that the thing dies in the process so when you are able to understand a poem in all its entirety uh, when you are able to identify all its individual parts and how together they form one meaning only then the poem is going to live uh, otherwise it is going to die and lose its meaning so uh, being animal poet uh, uh, let's uh, talk about characteristics of Ted Hughes animal poems. Before we move to Ted Hughes poetry uh, or Ted Hughes animal poems, it is very important to uh, understand his theory, his theorizing of uh, uh, animal poems. Uh, poems um, or what he actually and why he actually writes animal poems so faunal world that is the world of animal gets voice through you so um, uh, different there have been different subjects over the centuries uh, writers have been talking about and for use it is the faunal world it is the world of animals that is important to focus on uh, poems are directly titled on animals there are many poems around um, 80 to uh, around 80 percent of his poems they are based on the titles that are, um, are titled after uh, animals he is for this very reason for uh, the depiction of uh, animals and mostly of the violent animals he's called the poet of violence and we find a very graphic description in dead use he represents violence and indifference in humans through animals it is not only animals he it, though animals are the subject matter but at the very heart lies the theme that is human being himself and um, uh, the uh, and through uh, humans uh, and he, it is through animals that he depicts humans and he represents humans he seeks violence as manifestation of an animal energy ad and identity he does not see violence in terms in, in negative terms rather he sees as a um, as an uh, open manifestation of uh, endless energy and um, uh, vitality that nature has put in animals many a times um, in use poetry we see that man is at this advantage and animal or birds uh, that are most of the time predatory animals they are more um, they are put at an advantage and man at a disadvantage Ted Hughes has um, we see from his poetry that has sympathetic view of animals he creates his own myth through animal life as I've already told you that creating myths mean to uh, give new meaning to life to understand life in terms of animal life he shows mythical and mystical connection between man and the universe so um, uh, every poem every piece of art or literature has been expression or has um, uh, has been expression of an understanding the right or an artist has of the world and the medium he uses he represented through them so it is in um, uh, Ted use through the use of animal imagery that he sees this mythical and mystical connections between man and universe he perceives feral energy feral is the animal en em energy as central to the cosmos as central to the universe so the energy the abundant um, vitality that he sees or witness in his uh, in animals he uh, looks at it as central to uh, the cosmos then animal being symbols of this energy okay uh, we see that uh, if you talk about um, uh, use animal 
imagery or his use of uh, depiction of animals we we find a complete journey we see that every new book brought that use reputation of animal poet and uh, uh, and why he got this uh, reputation because of the complexity with which he treats animal it's not just a graphic representation in which like a painting and man, uh, uh, an animal is being depicted rather it has a complexity of idea or thought that is associated with that animal uh, the richer symbolism of success uh, successive poems or the poems after poem that he uh, wrote they were enriched in symbolism the animals do not multi multiply this is something interesting that he started writing uh, with animal uh, poetry uh, when he started writing animal poetry it gave an impression that he is uh, going to write more about animals and that this is fact but one thing that uh, that was not expected was that the number of animal decrease in, in rather than multiplying so they not only decrease in number they also decrease in size and strength so um, in, in the uh, in his first phase of writing poetry we see that there is a depiction of animals but then he uh, then the uh, the focus of his attention started moving towards man himself and then he gave uh, give, uh, then he uh, gave place to man who was um, allegorized in animal shape so as a, que a consequence of this a uh, change of focus and this is letras that i'm quoting here man is turned into main motif in his last book so may a uh, man animal uh, is the focus uh, if we talk if we um, divide tedious writing career in uh, three phases in the first one we find animals in the second it is the debate both about men and animal and it is in the third phase it is purely um, a man that is in focus but he again is being depicted through um, uh, different animals and his is a world which is not suited to innocent beings beings without malice or second thoughts such as animals and children so uh, animal and children they remain innocent uh, and without malice in the world of dead use so the three kinds of animals um, uh, according to mastery and uh, letters who is uh, who is an italian uh, sorry who is a latin um, uh, the one who uh, has, he has done his uh, research work on dead use um, use of animal imagery and he write in, uh, writes in his dissertation that there are three types of animals described in dead use poetry and this is very important to, uh, important point to understand so uh, if you are able to understand this um, this point you will be able to understand the entire lecture so big uh, the number one is big predatory animals who kill mercilessly when attacked big animals who are merciless second small animals of prey killed by men to satisfy his desire for power so uh, here uh, the intervention of men started in his second phase and the animals are shown in relation with the men and third and the last phase is or the third category is the allegorical animals who represent men so we see that the first uh, category that describes uh, predatory animals um, uh, a very important collection of poems the hawk in the rain uh, that was written in 1957 contain, uh, contains such poems that describe or represent such um, ferocious animals in ho in his hawk uh, the hawk in the rain um, the animals are wild ferocious but they are also shown as happy and free happy and free because they are close to nature and they are living the uh, life um, uh, the way uh, god has created them they live in a world which has room enough for them and in the poem in in such uh, in this collection uh, some important and uh, famous poems are the jaguar second glance at a jaguar and the hawk in the rain and um, later on we are going to talk about the jaguar as well uh, in the second phase um, uh, by the end of 1960 he wrote a collection of poems Luprical Luprical um, was a poem uh, which by contrast in which by contrast there is a great variety of animals unlike the hawk in the rain but the animals represented are not that big and strong so in the first phase um, uh, or in the hawk in the rain we find animals who are big and who are predatory and ferocious as well but in the second phase um, we find that there are uh, the number of or the variety of animal is uh, more 
but they are not that big and strong. They are shown to reside in the tamed world of humans. Some are even victimized uh, like dogs and goats. Uh, they figure forth small animals of prey persecuted and killed by man to satisfy his desire for power. And uh, we find that the uh, the important and prominent poems in uh, in this uh, phase are pike, thrushes and otter and uh, we are also going to talk about pike and otter later on. And the last phase, the la third phase in which he is more focused on human but that human is being allegorized through a myth uh, that uh, uh, Ted Hughes created through his crow poems that, were pub that was a collection of poems entirely fake focused on, uh, on, uh, on the poems related to crows in 1970. In book after book the animals draw a dwarf down in beauty, size, vigor, elegance till they are reduced to a black, filthy, sensuous, cynical bird, the crow. So this is the last uh, phase in which uh, we find that uh, animal be from being very vigorous and beautiful, they move to uh, ugly, black, filthy bird like crow. And here the famous poems are two legends, um, Examination at the Womb Door, a very um, interesting poem, Crow's First Lesson, that is also the part of your syllabus, and Crow's Fall. So we moved uh, to phase one, and uh, we are going to uh, deal with the very first animal poem that uh, uh, that is a part of the hawk in the rain, the thought fox. Okay. Um, uh, th about Thought Fox, um, Ted Hughes says in uh, in his book, Poetry in the Making, I was sitting up late one snowy night in dreary lodgings in London. I had written nothing for a year or so, but that night I got the idea. So he is here telling that he had had a um, uh, writer's block. He was not able to write uh, for long, uh, for quite a long time, but suddenly he had an idea one night. I, uh, he, I got the idea I might write something, and I wrote in a few minutes the following poem, the first animal poem I ever wrote. Here it is, the thought fox, and it is so remarkably um, representative poem of Ted Hughes, and he calls it the first animal poem he ever wrote. The poem is uh, written in six quatrains, that is, uh, quatrain is um, the stanza of four lines. It is about a fox, apparently, as the title suggests as well, a fox that is not a fox. This is what Ted Hughes says in Poetry in the Making. Rather, it is a fox which is both a fox and a Spirit. So the fox, the animal and the spirit uh, that actually makes that fox come to life. It is not an ordinary fox. Why it is not an ordinary fox? Because it is not, it does not belong to the natural world, it does not belong to the, uh, to the um, real fox or um, of wildlife rather it is a fox that is created by an author by 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 an artist and for this very reason this is an immortal fox it is not going to die simply because it is it is created by an artist and uh, the more if we really want to understand uh, the the main gist of the poem simply compare the last line of first stanza with the last line of last stanza of the poem the la, uh, in, in the the last stanza of the first uh, the last line of the first stanza is and this blank page where my fingers move and stanza Six, the last line is the page is printed. So the entire poem is a journey um, that uh, that um, completes or that um, that presents uh, the beginning or the existence of two things. One is the creation of the fox um, and the second one is the creation or the writing of poetry. An animal poem in which the poet's inspira inspiration is compared to a fox making a sudden and silent entry into his head. In this case, instinct replaces intellect, as the poet says. Till with a sudden sharp heart stink of fox, it enters the dark hole of the head. The window is tallest till the clock ticks, the page is printed. So the writer makes you move from uh, first stanza to the last stanza and through a gradual uh, entry of a fox uh, and along with that fox the entry of the thought and final uh, result is the 
uh, is that the page is printed that the poem is being written and it is being completed uh, this is the uh, image of the poem and I simply have un, um, highlighted some words that show you how this poem shows a journey of um, the creation of fox as well as the creation of the poem how fox or the poem comes into existence so the very uh, first word that i have highlighted in the first stanza is something so this is something that is not clear either it's a fox or it's a poem so something becomes something more near in the second stanza then it takes the form of fox's nose then in the fourth stanza um, uh, uh, he talks about sets neat prints into the snow so how we see that from something to uh, uh, neat prints uh, we, uh, we are being taken by the uh, the narration of the speaker and in the next stanza he talks about that creature that is fox coming finally it has taken a tangible form it is coming and then enters coming is again showing uh, um, the ing shows the uh, process and uh, enters is actually when something is complete and the page is printed so uh, if we talk about um, the immortality of fox uh, ted use himself says every time i read the poem the fox comes up again out of the darkness every time i read the poem the fox comes up again out of the darkness and steps into my head and i suppose that long after i'm gone as long as a copy of the poem exists every time anyone reads it the fox will get up somewhere out in the darkness and come walking towards them and it is only through the power of words and this is the same theory the idea that we were discussing in the beginning that how a poem is a spirit how it is a creature that is a, uh, that is living and it has its uh, its own existence similarly the fox that actually does not exist but it every time it will um, uh, it will come um, into existence whenever a reader is going to open the page and going through the poem so from um, the thought fox we move to the next poem from the hawk in the rain that belongs to the his first phase of writing poetry that focuses on the uh, on the big predatory and uh, uh, vigorous animals and that is jaguar um, the poem through this po uh, poem uh, what Ted Hughes represents is the energy and vigor of uh, another animal that is jaguar the poem is written five quatrains and quatrain is a form uh, again it's a, it's a stanza of four lines and it is interesting to see that uh, in many many of his poems you'll find that the uh, the form of the stanza usually is a quatrain okay first two stanzas of the poem deal with the description of other animals and birds not directly the poem is not directly uh, uh, the poem does not deal directly with the with jaguar in the first two stanza uh, it in the first two stanza uh, ted use talks about the apes yawn the parrots shriek tiger and lion uh, and uh, all these animals or birds they seem to be fatigued with indolence and they lie still as the sun okay so the animals or the birds represented they are lying still as the sun and we we see that cage after cage seem empty though there are animals though there are birds but still they seem empty be, empty because of the stillness of animals they are all very set in their captivated um, uh, uh, situation but it is only in the third stanza that change or a shift occurs and this third stanza is entirely is in, is in contrast with the first two can, uh, uh, stanzas because it is going to deal with the jaguar of the poem a jaguar hurrying in rage not in boredom so it's not in boredom rather th there is no cage doom and this is something very interesting it has to do more with the uh, the attitude of the jaguar that it is imprisoned sort of imprisoned in cage like all other animals and birds but it does not he do, uh, it does not seem to uh, feel like being captivated and it has th it exhibits the same energy and vitality that it will um, exhibit in a natural environment like forest or some sort of jungle 
so it's very much uh, when it states the when the poem states there is no cage to him uh, it reminds me of um, uh, paradise lost by john milton where he says a mind is its own place and itself can make a heaven of hell a hell of heaven so it's all depends on one's thinking how you are or whatever you are uh, you remain uh, what what you are only if your willpower is strong enough. So his stride, the stride of the jaguar, is wilderness in is wilderness in freedom. The world the world rolls under the long thrust of his heel over the cage floor. The horizon comes. So uh, this is the uh, jaguar of uh, uh, of the poem that uh, uh, who behaves like the monarch who behaves as if he it does not or it does not care about uh, being captive rather it has it shows the same energy the same mood or aura that it will show uh, in a natural setting um, uh, this is the image of the poem that i have uh, that you are uh, that i have put for you and uh, uh, we just simply need to look at the points or the words that i i have highlighted the words uh, highlighted with blue like yawn shriek strut fatigued indolence lie still fossil empty nursery wall they all represent uh, the stillness or the calm uh, position of the animals whereas the yellow color uh, the word but shows that this stanza is going to be in contrast with the first two stanzas because it is going to be uh, to deal with a jaguar so but and a jaguar it is being highlighted because it, from now onward the poem is going to change and then the words that are, are highlighted in green like mesmerized hurrying enraged fears fire bang death the air wilderness freedom thrust horizons they all define jaguar and its activity and they are completely in contrast with the words uh, highlighted in the blue so uh, very um, uh, summing up this point the uh, images of stillness that i uh, highlighted are yawn fatigue indolence still fossil empty and sleepers and these images of stillness are completely in contrast with the images of movement and awe that are the words like stares mesmerized dream hurrying and rage fierce bang and wilderness so what is uh, Ted Hughes is doing through uh, showing this contrast of uh, uh, contrast between stillness and movement? Ted Hughes is actually minimizing other animals by comparing them with it might be painted on a nursery wall. So the, all the animals uh, that are put in the cage, they are uh, simply representing a picture of a painted uh, of a wall. Um, um, of a nursery wall that is being painted but it is only one point at one place uh, and that is ja the cage of jaguar that life seems to uh, to be bursting with all its vitality and energy in the form of jaguar and uh, the, uh, by contrast um, uh, shows Ted Hughes shows the grandeur of the jaguar Okay, what is Ted use his uh, own idea about jaguar? He himself says about it. Uh, about it, a jaguar, after all, can be received in, um, sorry, perceived in several different aspects. He is a beautiful, powerful nature spirit. Okay, look at the words, different words that he's going to use for jaguar. Beautiful, powerful nature spirit. He's homicidal manic. Uh, again, homicidal, homicidal manic, uh, the one who is prone to or, in, uh, or intent, uh, inclined towards violence. He is a supercharged piece of cosmic machinery. Cosmic uh, has to do with universe. So he is the emblem of representative of universal energy. He is a symbol. And it is interesting that he um, Ted Hughes calls Jaguar he, not it. He is a symbol of man's baser. Baser, mean, nature, shoved down the id and growing cannibal murderers with deprivation. Id is if, uh, ID id. If you are um, familiar with the idea related to ego, superego and id in terms of psychology, it is the storehouse of human desire. So, uh, Jaguar shows that potential, that energy a uh, man has uh, about his desire. He's an ancient symbol of Dionysius, 
since he is a leopard raised to the ninth power. Dionysus, um, as you know, uh, was a, a Greek god and a Greek god of fertility. So, jaguar represents that energy for uh, fertility and uh, power for regeneration. He is a pre precise historical symbol of the bloody-minded Aztecs. And so, bloody-minded Aztecs, Aztecs refer to a tribe, a Mexican tribe um, uh, in ancient times. Or he is simply a demon. Okay, in the beginning, he uh, Tedius was calling Jaguar beautiful and powerful nature spirit. By, but by the end, he is calling it a demon, a lump of um, ectoplasm, a lump of astral energy. Astral uh, has to do with stars. So, uh, we see that Jaguar uh, 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 use tries to uh, give so many attributes to Jaguar that Jaguar resists any definition. He uh, Jaguar does not uh, come under any uh, description or definition by uh, uh, or he is he, he is the one who uh, does not retain any definition he rather refuses any def definition or description it is something that is impossible to define this is what Ted Hughes is trying to uh, uh, say in through this uh, through these lines the next point to do is hawk roosting Okay, uh, we find um, the, again the Herculean image of the hawk. Hawk sits on the top of a tree and surveys the amions. Okay, uh, we see that the, the, there is this bird who is being talked about and he has that Hercu Herculean. Herculean is a word from Hercules, uh, who was a Greek uh, warrior and a hero uh, known for his strength and power. So similarly, hawk has that uh, legendary aura about, uh, about it. It is uh, sitting on the top of the tree and it is surveying its surrounding. It is personified in such a manner that we treat it like a human it is shown as a highly optimistic and reasonable creature the qualities the attributes that are particularly associated with humans okay uh, so um, uh, in the in the same poem uh, Ted Hughes gives a difference between hu uh, hawk and human and why the uh, hawk roosting is important because um, uh, this shows a connection between uh, a man and uh, and, and a bird or a predatory word and this poem particularly belongs to his second phase of uh, the poetry it lives in a real world it hawk lives in a real world and has no falsifying dreams no falsifying dreams no illusions about its future not over ambitious like human beings and this is the basic difference between a hawk and a human that uh, um, uh, hawk is has no over ambitious uh, attitude he has short-term goals and that goals include simply praying uh, and satiate his uh, hunger so his hunger is more important and his hunger is def uh, is something that defines his attitude uh, or his goals in life the hawk then we see is, is a symbol of monarchy he acts like a monarch he acts like a um, like a, a king because actually the hawk the uh, speaker in the poem is hawk who um, uh, speaks in the first pr a person pronoun it has no moral scruples about killing so it has nothing to do with conscience it has its own will if it wants to kill somebody it will he seems to have a godlike aura and this is where uh, uh, this is how he it is depicted godlike aura means to have full control over his creation believes that the environment and even nature trees sun trees and the wild world all are his subordinates and this is what uh, hawk believes about his surroundings and about the animals he maintains his commanding status and boasts that, in, that the entire earth has its face upward for my inspection why face or uh, the, uh, the face of the earth upward for my inspection because uh, uh, we have seen uh, that the hawk is sitting on the top of a tree and everything below belongs to earth and everything seems to see upward uh, to inspect uh, inspect uh, hog and th th that for this very reason he feels like he is an exact center of the universe so th there is this feeling of supreme being that he feels he uh, he seems to be bursting with pride with where he is wondering at the creation of his claws so simply when he is talking about its claw which he actually calls foot instead of claw again foot uh, makes uh, makes it or humanizes this bird as if it is designed specially by the whole of creation to have a firm grip at his victim it says i kill where i please because it is all mine there is no sophistry in my body my manners are tearing off 
heads so the will of the hawk is important for his survival and he always has his will and this is what uh, uh, ted use calls the power uh, the will power um uh, the hawk roosting is also important in the sense because um, uh, the uh, the uh, the bird represented in this poem is uh, is not simply a, a bird that is uh, given some very uh, that is shown with some vigor or vitality rather it has a personality of its own and the uh, hawk uh, no doubt uh, holds a very prominent um, position among ted use uh, animal poems or uh, creature or representation of uh, creatural life uh, we see that uh, hawk is egocentric proud boastful too conscious of being uh self sufficient the hawk worries only about imposing his position in the world it says i sit in the top of the wood my eyes closed in action no falsifying dreams between my hooked head and hooked feet or in sleep rehearse perfect kills and eat and this is that he is not only not only the entire universe seems to be a subord uh, to be his subordinate subordinate rather he is so egocentric uh, egocentric that he is only thinking about himself even in his dreams the hawk becomes the creator for this very reason we move to the second uh, phase that is uh, um, uh, and uh, there is a uh, Uh, and the poem uh, the important poem uh, poems for, uh, from this phase from this collection uh, the one that deal with the connection between man and a bird is uh, b- man and animal is thrushes view of a pig and pike thrushes is a poem that presents uh, 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 thrushes as petrifying bird they are, he calls them distracting devils and uh, their only purpose is to satisfy their urge to kill in a view of a pig is a, is also a poem um, that, that is a, uh, that deals with the theme of death itself and in pike we find two contradictory traits it is ferocious savage and frightening but it is also calm and quiet so uh, we are going to deal with the last poem that is pike in the second phase okay we move to pike okay uh, there are 11 quatrains in uh, this poem one of uh, and uh, ted use himself calls this poem one of my catch prizes i felt like doing some pike fishing but in circumstances where there was no chance of it i and over the days i remember the extreme pleasures of that sport bits of the following poem began to arrive so he when he was actually thinking of going for fishing uh, and he was unable to do so he wrote this poem i captured not just a pike captured in the form of writing poem i captured the whole pond including the monsters i never even hooked i never even hooked um uh, make us remind uh, make us think of again uh, thought fox the last line the page is printed it is only through words rhythms and uh, uh, images that he is able to um, uh, represent pike the poem is about pike as um, as the title suggests the first four stanzas describe pike uh, pike it's uh, it's all description of the pike and these are the lines of, uh, the first two lines are, are from stanza 1 killers from the egg so pike are the killers from the egg they are malevolent and aged grin and uh, they uh, one is stunned by their Uh, they are stunned by their own grandeur so they have uh, this uh, this aura of grandeur about them and a uh, uh, 100 feet long in their world and uh, gloom of their stillness so uh, uh, they have their grandeur they have their stillness they have a different aura about them so the jaws hooked and clamp and fangs refer that they are predatory by nature okay uh, then uh, uh, the speaker in the poem uh, gives the description of three pike in a glass jar that they, they are very small uh, the uh, the one uh, one is of 3 inches second one is of 4 inches and the third uh, pike is of 4 and a half inches but then he says in the next line sudden Finally, there were two. Finally, uh, one. So um, uh, it's a mistake here. Suddenly there were two. Finally, one means, uh, and indeed they spared nobody. It means that uh, um, um, the speaker kept them um, uh, in a hungry uh, state, and uh, they, out of hunger, ate uh, them each other. and still legendary depth uh, it was as deep as england at and at this point it the poem seems to give a shocking uh, point where he is comparing pike with england being ferocious in nature 
okay we see that pike this poem is a submarine journey into the life of pike throughout the poem the pike grows larger the predatory of my uh, Okay, we see that the, uh, throughout the poem, the pike grows larger. And um, uh, uh, one rule that this uh, particular creature follows is might is right. Uh, whoever is powerful or who is, uh, is stronger will rule. Gives it almost, uh, in this poem, uh, Ted Hughes gives it almost a mythological status. And uh, it deals with the ferocity of its nature despite the small size. And for this very reason, the speaker says that the pike, this fish that has a grandeur about itself, provokes a feeling of awe and fear in the speaker. Okay, uh, according to Letras, Pikes represents the modern man with his lust for, for power because we see that there were three fish and uh, one ate the, uh, the other two. And uh, uh, this is what we call the survival instinct of, of the modern man as well. It represents the inhuman world on of human beings. We see that as the pike becomes huge, the poet becomes desperate to fish because he is unable to control them. Similarly, we, find, we see or the other message that the point uh, aims at is that God being creator seems to have lost uh, uh, control over human beings and uh, it, uh, the poem also represents uh, sort of a shaky belief or the uh, the the shaky belief of the modern man in God and uh, the metaphor of Britain that is being used for Pike also represents um, this uncertainty the people uh, feel they have about uh, their existence so the next poem that uh, we quickly are going to uh, go through is uh, is an otter. Uh, it is another poem uh, from Lopricol, which portrays the modern man in uh, uh, and uh, uh, Lop. Uh, an otter is uh, a creature that is neither fish nor beast and it is uh, the one that uh, lives both on water and on land and it has uh, it is without any definite uh, characteristics and for this very reason it has no fixed identity and uh, it remains throughout uh, without answers. Okay, uh, we see that uh, uh, otter and uh, through otter it uh, uh, shows that uh, author is always dissatisfied like human beings and it has this this disability to settle at one place the author is everything a prey and a predator a seeker and a searcher a loser and a winner, winner. that is the author is everything and nothing at the same time so uh, author is something that is in a sort of uh, a state of alienation and uh, a sort of disillusionment the modern man faces and this is exactly what uh, use captures through this poem okay we move to the uh, th third phase of uh, uh, to use uh, poetry in which he was more focused on human being but he here he developed a certain mythology of his own or certain allegory or symbolism through which he uh, defined the attitudes, the ambivalent attitudes of human beings. And in that uh, phase, the most prominent work that he wrote uh, is the his collection of uh, crow poems. And uh, from that collection, uh, we are going to talk about his poem, Crow's First Lesson. Crow has many characteristics common with men through it use explores human psyche and this is something very important uh, crow is uh, is an image that is uh, uh, that is uh, that has all that always has some symbolic significance as far as this uh, collection of poems is concerned it is ever present ever present like god though it's very uh, tiny creature in comparison with the jaguar and the hawk um, uh, or the fox of the first phase but still uh, it is something that is more complex as far as its existence is concerned it's uh, uh, dead use almost gives it a mythological status it is a trickster um, according to uh, the legendary accounts of um, fables uh, many uh, writers have shown crow as a trickster and at many places ted hughes also shows him as a trickster and for this very reason uh, he gives uh, ted hughes gives so many att attributes to the uh, to this bird that uh, it in itself makes uh, it a complex symbol okay before the publication of his uh, collection of poem crow Ted Hughes uh, describes the attitude of crow on BBC as 
He says, the crow is the most intelligent of birds. He lives in just about every piece of land on earth. And there is a great body of folklore about crows, of course. No carrion will kill a crow. The crow is the indestructible bird. Okay, at one place, uh, Ted Hughes is calling this bird immortal and here he is calling this bird an uh, indestructible bird who suffers everything suffers nothing uh, suffer and uh, suffers nothing shows that uh, because of his detachment with the surrounding or, what, or whatever is going on uh, shows that he uh, he suffers nothing for this very reason it shows a sort of a detached attitude towards the universe around itself uh, the poem, uh, a Crow's first, letter, uh, first Lesson, dramatizes God's attempt to teach Crow to say love. And love being an important uh, theme in the poem as well. But Crow simply gaped and is completely unable to utter. The, it is interesting to uh, see that uh, uh, Crow is incapable of uttering this word. And if this creature is incapable of uttering, we need to see symbolically what sort of a man or human Ted Hughes is uh, trying to depict who is completely unable to utter or understand the word love. So there are three attempts to teach the crow in the poem. In first attempt, crow utters description of a deadly shark that crashed into the sea, uh, uh, but still remains uh, incapable of uh, uttering the word. In the second, then it talks of disease-bearing organisms such as a fly and mosquito. Again, the, um, uh, the filthy, the grotesque creatures, the... Uh, the one that are uh, okay and the final attempt at god's final attempt it vomits out so finally uh, the, uh, the crow is something that is not able uh, not able to or not capable of containing the uh, the importance or the significance of love and it simply vomits out a man's bodiless head and uh, and the a, a woman's ulva which drops on a man's head and both get entangled uh, that obviously create uh, uh, a sexual image uh, or the physical love that that is uh, being given in the in the third attempt so idea uh, which uh, uh, Ted Hughes presents is that there is nothing like love as far as the character of crow is concerned and the relationship between a man and woman is just physical even the god who is a very important character like um, uh, crow in the poem is reduced to a human level because god cries on his failed attempt to reach what love is it also indicates god's failure in creating eternal love between man and woman so crow's first lesson is the one in which um, uh, it is shown that there the impossibility of having pure true love uh, between a man and a woman it's always physical this is what crow seems to believe what is interesting to note that the crow soon realizes its mistake and flies off with a heavy sense of guilt the true struggled together on the grass god struggled to part them cursed wept crow flew guiltily off so here god the uh, the the image of god loses its loses its grandeur whereas crow seems to have this human trait uh, the feeling of being guilty is something that is associated with human feelings uh, it is not uh, it is not particular to animals but uh, crow seems to have this uh, or uh, ted you seems to bestow a crow with this uh, uh, human trait for the, so uh, for this very reason the complexity of idea um, the idea become more complex simply because of the attributes that are given to uh, the god and the one given to the crow uh, okay uh, thus go uh, god weeps for the sorry and degenerate state of man humankind and also at the struggle between a man and a woman though god was supposed to teach the crow a lesson all of all important love he ends up, God ends up learning a lesson from the crow itself. So the crow, crow's first lesson ironically becomes God's lesson. This is what one critic seemed to say. Uh, now we sum up our discussion and I'll uh, quote here. Uh, Mastery uh, M. Letras who says, Crow is physical, earthy. He can enjoy sex but not love. His world is different from the other birds. Crow 
he says is an outcast in the world of birds and an outcast in the world of men as well so this is the bird that does not belong to uh, to its own kind nor not uh, not seem to belong the world of human beings it is unable to understand the world's infinitude he is content in merely existing he does not try to improve anything in himself or in the world he watches everything rather cynically receives what is his takes profit of whatever he can but never gives anything in exchange it is this brutal selfish attitude of crow which makes him so man like that has shocked lots of critics and poetry readers so a bird that is being shown directly in contrast with the bird like hawk uh, it shocks the critics as well as the reader because it is a character the crow is a character that is devoid of any human sympathy uh, no matter whatever the circumstances are uh, it seems uh, it remains um indifferent or detached with whatever is going on and this is uh, to some extent is a state of a, a modern man where um, one person is not concerned with the matters of the other person it remains detached like crow okay um, summing up the entire discussion on animal imagery we say we can say that use um, and the animal image poems show uh, ted use acute or keen observation of the animals and uh, the more uh, the uh, the focus in his poetry is on the energy and vitality of animals uh, we find in um, uh, in ted use poems Uh, the visual impressions of such a- of these animals and um, this uh, the animals they are a way they are the means of understanding the world for ted use and um, uh, for these animals he also attempts to give a different meaning to the reality so the so the reality so the reality is the one that being human being is given to us being the part of the society uh, an individual is given and this is the exact idea that ted use uh, uh, rejects he does uh, d- does not accept the given reality rather he is more towards creating his own reality his own meanings of the things around himself so finally um, uh, if we talk about ted use his contribution uh, to the 20th century poetry we see that he has interpreted modern life and modern man in terms of myths and symbols and this is shubham singh that i am quoting here to sum up my discussion uh, his observation is that uh, ted use has interpreted modern life and modern man in terms of myths and symbols okay and uh, he says that uh, uh, ted use enriched english poetry and enlarged its scope and its sound so uh, the skylark the uh, the nightingales of romantics they have their own uh, extension but uh, as far as ted use poetry is concerned he has given altogether a different dimension to the writing of poetry and he has introduced um, a, a sort of a, a dimension in which the poetry can be taken uh, in the form of animal poetry the thought takes tangible shape in the dark consciousness of the poet's mind in the same way as a fox enters a dark forest and then comes out of it suddenly and this is exactly what happens in tedious poetry that they uh, be it an animal an idea or flower or anything belonging to creature world it takes tangible form but at the same time uh, that form is also the part of uh, of uh, writing uh, writing of poetry so the point that i uh, discussed in the beginning that uh, the entire journey of ted use poetry moves from uh, capturing animal to capturing animal that is to capture animal in real life to capturing animal in the form of poetry is what Uh, shubham singh is also talking about and here we reach the end of our discussion i hope it will add to uh, to your understanding and for here are uh, here is a work cited list and uh, um the uh, uh, two or three books that i would uh, like you to uh, go through if you get hold of them if you can get hold of them the poetry and poetry in the making which is an anthology of poems and programs from listening and writing by ted use himself and selected poems by ted use and the uh, another book that i would refer is letras mestri m uh, or sorry mestri m uh, letras uh, dissertation or thesis on the violent art of ted use that's all thank you so much